three days of scanning, we got through somewhere around 15,000 slides, if you can believe that. So I think if you were there, if you're interested in slides as much as that group was, this would be a great presentation for you today. Just a reminder, this will be recorded. So all of us at Easy Photo Scan want to thank you for spending a few minutes with us on this Valentine's Day. All of you are special and sweet to us. Congratulations to the winners of last month's drawing, April R., Judy S., and Lorinda L. on the $25 gift certificate to the Easy Photo Scan store. And you want to make sure to take that survey that will be in our follow-up communications in order to enter this month's giveaway prize. It will be a new edition of the David Bush book, Mastering Digital Scanning. It'll be Rick and Chris will be using this as the source for this month's webinar, Mastering Digital Scanning with Slides, Film, and Transparencies. And our bet is you will want to really enjoy next month's presentation as we look at some of the rather alternative uses for your photo scanner can be used as we delve into the world of scanography. Admittedly, this is going to be a bit off our normal selection of topics in our webinar series. However, you'll be amazed at what a little creative imagination combined with non-photo items can become using a photo scanner. That's coming up next month, March 14th at 2 p.m. You won't want to miss it. Look for the registration in our communication to you following this presentation. Remember, this presentation will be recorded and we will send you a link via email 24 hours after the presentation so you can access it wherever you need to. Also, be sure to complete the short survey to enter the contest and register for next month's webinar. Now, with all that said, it's time to turn you over to our presenter today, Rick Lippert from Easy Photo Scan and Chris Southard from CDS Media Solutions. Rick? Hey, James. Thanks so much for the great introduction. Um, it's fantastic to be here. As, as James said, we just got back from the world's largest family genealogy program. And uh, boy, we saw a few slides. <laughs> and, and we got a lot of them. Uh, we got a lot of them digitized and preserved, and that was a lot of fun. Hey, Chris, are you there with us yet? Hi, Rick. Yes, I am. Perfect. So Chris joining us from the Cincinnati area, and uh, we're looking forward to walking through this process together. Chris and I had a, a fun ex experience, and we'll get into that just a little bit uh, in the presentation about a visit we just made to to one of the luminaries that created the software that folks use a lot when dealing with digitizing slides. So that was a lot of fun. So. Best practices in saving your 35 millimeter slides through digitization. Um, I just love this topic. Slides are always a great item because the challenge is that with slides, they wind up in boxes in a closet. No one has a projector anymore. No one can see them. And literally, like what happened to us last week, we had a gentleman come up and says, I have not even seen these images for 60 years. And so unlike photographs that we use reflective lighting to see, you can kind of pull out a photograph and at least see them, slides are a little bit different. However, I want to just put a little bit of a word of caution to you about some of the things that we're going to do here. Um, and let me just move on over to our next slide. This topic is very much like icebergs. And our subject, it's a large one. It's a big one. Unfortunately, to get through it all, you know, we're going to see a certain exposed part. And we can, we'll do as much as Chris and I can do to expose as much as we can. But there's still a lot. 87% of an iceberg is under the water. And so it's lurking below the surface. We'll do our best to expose everything that we can. And I think uh, as Chris and I were developing this, we kind of came up with the idea of splitting it up into another session. And we'll share with you a little bit more about that in a moment. As James said, we're going to be using this book 
mastering digital scanning with slides, films, and transparencies as kind of our textbook and our guide to walk through. And the reason I'm going to do that is, although this book was published in 2003, and there was a, set, there was a second edition that came out about a year and a half later, it is truly a Bible about things to consider, not necessarily for those that are professionals, but those that are consumers and photo fans and looking to learn to use images that originated on slides, transparencies, and film. And the author is David Bush. Um, David, you may have read some of his things. He's got over 2 million copies in print. He's, he's generated more than 200 books. and He's been in all sorts of articles. and uh, He's been a newspaper and magazine journalist and a photojournalist and a studio photographer. And he's just got a wealth of knowledge. And the reason I just love this book and my book is uh, the covers are completely worn off of it and the reason that it is is it's so useful it has so many good things that are still pertinent even today so I wanted to just share with you if you're having a problem trying to navigate through that process of what you need to do to do best practices for scanning your slides I want to kind of show you how the author David Bush divided up his look at the topics. And then we're going to modify that a little bit because we can't get through all 380 something or 323 pages of the information in this same webinar in just a few minutes. But I want to share with you, first he looked at scanning from 50,000 feet. And he, so if you don't have a lot of good understanding, I recommend you try to find a copy of that book. It's still available, both new and used versions. And get a hold of it and share it with your friends if you are amenable to that. You know, it's, it's still only in print. But take a look at getting a good idea of that 50,000 foot. And then he talks about kind of technology and techniques. And you can see how he's divided things up to choosing scanners and uh, looking at film only scanners, flatbeds, using outside services. He even plays around a little bit with do it yourself solutions. Then he goes over and looks at manipulating pixels and how to craft the image into the art that kind of is created as a result of the scanning. And so he takes an introduction to how do you look at your enhancements of your images and fine tune them. And then finally, the one thing, and my book is kind of worn out backwards, the one thing that David Bush understands is he understands how to communicate pretty effectively in definitions. And this has one of the best illustrated glossaries for scanning and digital terminology that I use not only just for transparency scanning, but I also use it for any type of reflective scanning or whatever. It's simple, easy to use, it's cram packed with, with most of the terminology. So I really encourage you to take a look at that if you'd like. So how are we going to do our session today? Well, what Chris and I are going to do is we're going to divide it up somewhat similarly. We're going to look at, first of all, the background you need to understand those special requirements for film scanning and the best scans and how to do that, how the scanning works. We're not going to touch a lot about all the different brands of scanners and that type of thing. We'll touch on maybe categories and, and, and sections and how for you to make a good decision if you don't already have a scanner. And then we're going to look at, and this is why Chris is here, we're going to touch on the techniques about enhancing your images. Chris is an expert in photo uh, in color management, and I asked him to join us to talk about some of the more specialties. He does a lot of slide scanning as well. The things we're not going to cover, and I think we've decided we're going to do this in a, another subsequent session, is that fine tuning and kind of how to handle all of those when things when good things go bad is what I've called them. We're going to talk about them, and, and as time permits, we'll we'll try to address as much as we can. But they can get pretty detailed, can't they, Chris? Uh, yes, definitely. And you can uh, you can spend hours retouching, and beauty's in the eyes of the beholder. And I I just don't want to get wrapped up in in one topic where it's not pertinent to someone else, because we try to approach something that everybody will enjoy, 
for this session. So that's how we're going to take the approach. I hope everybody agrees with it. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the journey that has kind of led us up. We needed like a confluence of things to get us to the point that we're at now. One is computing power, the other is digitization equipment in the scanner part. Then there's the storage and the capacity to actually uh, store this information that has been digitized, the versatility in software, and then there's standards that we want to embrace. So let's take a quick walk down Journey's Lane and look at computing power. And I'm going to pick the year 1986 and around that point of time. Many of you may not have even been born at that time. But if you were, this was the compact computer. And it, it was the desktop 386. It had a whopping 32-bit microprocessor. And it had 4 kilobytes of memory. Yeah, that's right, 4 KB of memory. And it sold for the whopping price of $7,999. We've come a long ways. Most everybody that will be using scanners today and doing your slides will be able to buy a computer that is well under $1,000 that will more than quad, uh, quintuple the kinds of uh, power that these had. but. We picked 1986 because that's when we started seeing scanning start to come alive. And Compact had a lot to do with that as well as some of the other uh, uh, manufacturers like Apple. So we talked a little bit about scanners. And the ScanJet was HP's first scanner. It had 300 DPI. It was 4 bits deep, 16 levels of gray. It only it only scanned monochrome, right? It came out in 1987, and it could be attached to things like that compact. And that device was able to scan 8.5 by 11.7 inches, and it sold for $1,500. That's the same kind of scanner with the and and uh, superlative quality enhancements. If you go down to your local big discount box store, and you can get that thing. What can you get it for, Chris, now? 89 bucks, something like that? Uh, pretty much, yeah. 89 to 100 bucks. Yeah, so you can see we've come a long ways. Um, the challenge is, though, that for reflective scanning, we were on the road, but we weren't on the road for transmissive scanning or for when light has to pass through. Because we need higher resolution. Our, our originals are smaller, right? We needed ways to compensate for dust specs. We needed to hold the slides so that we could focus them. We needed a way to have a much longer dynamic range because there's a higher DMAX on slides, 35 millimeter slides, and a lower D-min. And we needed to a way to address the vendor's film mask and color slides. So if you've ever scanned slides before, you'll notice that sometimes you see that orange kind of cast over it. That's actually an inherent component placed in the film composition. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. So we needed all of that to come around. We also needed to come around with a little bit more storage capacity because we needed higher resolution, right? Here, we, in 1987, were finally introduced to the Bernoulli drive from iOmega. It was a whopping, you get it, 10 megabytes of data. And that thing sold for a whopping 90 bucks a piece. Now, I'll tell you, that's when I entered this industry from a medical standpoint, and we used to do ultrasound images and store them on these devices. And they were big, the five and a quarter floppy size. They were that size, only they were hard. And we thought we had just died and gone to heaven because we were holding a whole 10 megabytes in our hands. Now we have our little micro SD cards, and they're holding what, close to uh, a terabyte of information. So um, we've come a long ways. In fact, the price of storage has dropped from 90 bucks a megabyte to about 
the, uh, the our nine dollars a megabyte to about a, a, a sub intestinally small. It's like point zero 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 four uh, cents for a megabyte today. There was one other component that we needed to have in the formula in order to be successful in getting best scans for 35 millimeter slides, and that was software versatility. And in 1986, again, all at that same time, LaserSoft was formed and becomes a pioneer in the field of scanner and digital imaging software. And that software, the package itself, originally sold for four. $5,495. So if you added it all up and you wanted to scan some stuff, you would probably need to have somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000 for the for the um, uh, for a minimum transparency scanner. The drum scanners would go up to a million dollars, but $10,000 for the for the scanner, 7 8,000 for the computer, 5000 for the software. The storage was very expensive. So you can see why 35 millimeter slides sat in a closet for 60 years. So now we come to the point that we have liberated this because we've had this confluence of all these cool things come together. In addition to that, we've begun to embrace some standards. These standards are funded through the Library of Congress. They're from a group entitled the Federal Agencies for Digital Guidelines Initiatives, or FAGI for short. I've included in this presentation a handout for you. And these are the latest 2016 FAGI guidelines. Included in them are those guidelines specifically for 35 millimeter film, for, for, for 35 millimeter slides and the digitization of them. And I encourage you to download that and look at it, study it. They use a star system from uh, one star to four star, where four star would be the highest quality, one star would be the least quality. And there's some guidelines there. And there's a lot of factors that you may not want to, to worry yourself with as you look for your practices for, for 35 millimeter scanning. However, there are many areas that I do believe you'll find to be useful. In fact, we'll touch on them in just a moment later. So with all of those factors, we're ready, set, and let's digitize. So the first thing that I recommend that we do is that we look at plotting a course. And when I mean plotting a course, what I'm talking about is coming up with a plan for what you want the end result to be. If we don't know where we're going, then we're just like Alice in Wonderland when she comes up to the fork in the road and asks the Cheshire Cat. Cheshire Cat says, where are you going? She says, I don't know. Which road should I take? And he says, it doesn't really matter because you don't know where you want to go. So we want you to know where to go. The first thing we'll do is let's take a look at those FAGI guidelines to help us a little bit to talk and plan our workflow process. The first thing let's do is we need to remember that our black and white 35 millimeter slide transparencies are considered positives. Okay? That's the one thing you want to remember when you're working with your software. The other is there is recommended equipment that you'd want to use. You could use a film scanner, a planetary scanner. Planetary scanner are the ones that have an extension and the object sits below and the recording device sits above. Digital cameras, flatbed scanners. Notice that those million dollar drum scanners no longer recommended by the, by the Library of Congress. Recommended resolutions start at one star is at least 500 pixels per inch and they move up to 2,000 pixels per inch. So that's kind of a good start. And so we know that if we go up higher in resolution, we're going to have a better quality. And that kind of makes sense. We've got three or four options for tools to use. And then we have some of these guidelines. And I just highlighted some of the key factors out of this. You can read them all on your own. But again, it pulls out the important part that because slides and 35 millimeter film have such this wide 
density range from this high Dmax to this low Dmin that it's very important to understand those challenges and look for the best optics. So we always want to look for the appropriate lens. We always want to make sure that we have a, a appropriate illumination that would be the light passing through it and that we want to profile the scanner according to FAGI does not always mean accurate color reproduction. So let's talk about that for a moment. So there was a time when we would use to profile, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes later, and Chris, um, you may want to jump in here, but um, every scanner can have a profile. And we'll talk about profile coloring in space in a minute, but that process doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate color reproduction. In fact, the Library of Congress and the FAGI group recommends that the best workflow may be to capture raw and adjust it in a calibrated environment and then tag the file with the appropriate color profile afterwards. Now, Chris, we were, we were with the folks at LaserSoft a couple of weeks ago, and doesn't that sound exactly what Carl was talking about? It does, exactly, yes. And so let me ask you, in your practice, do you go through the calibration process, or do you capture, and then work in a calibrated environment afterwards? Um, I, for the most part, I do the capture and roll, and then, uh, then um, adjust um, in a calibrated environment um, post-processing. OK. So that's the same thing that we've adopted here. So what does that mean to you? That means that you could probably look at finding a really good scanning device, something or a digitization tool, and going ahead and executing a good workflow and a good work in, in maintaining it in a good work environment. And then afterwards, right, according to what the Library of Congress says here, afterwards, we can still come through and then tag our color profiles and work through there. And I think that's probably, if I'm not mistaken, what a lot of people do. And if you, if you do something different, please go ahead and fill out a little question area in the box there, and we'll get to those questions in just a few moments. OK, last thing is you want to always make sure that you've got a properly calibrated viewing environment. So um, I know we use the monkey system um, for calibrating our monitors. Chris, do you calibrate your monitors? Um, actually, I do. but. Um it's been a while since I um, have done it, and I need to, to redo it. Uh, the device that I used, I forgot, it uh, was the, um, I think a Spider brand. Uh, mm -hmm. It malfunctioned, so I need to get a new one. Um, okay. But there's ways to manually calibrate your monitor without having uh, to purchase the device as well. And those are built into your monitors uh, to do that as well. So one of the things I think you're hearing us say is, when you start thinking about scanning 35 millimeter slides, you've got to think about this whole environment, the tools that we're using. And as Chris has indicated, there are some really, and especially now with the higher res and the more sophisticated monitors coming out, there are way more tools built in. And they've got little um, controls and, and this type of thing already in them. So calibration isn't quite as bad as those old CRTs that would have to warm up and this type of thing. Correct. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody uses those anymore, I don't think. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, now, let's start thinking about making a good, in, a good image. And the first thing we must know is, who is the enemy? And the enemy is dust. Now, I'm going to tell you more about dust in this presentation than you ever wanted to know. There is two kinds of dust, if you're aware of that. There's a sticky dust and an unaffixed dust. They're just the names themselves explain it. And you can, if you've got a dusty bookshelf, walk up and blow it, and the dust that, does, that just blows off, right, that's unaffixed. And the stuff that sticks, that sticks. Now, we're in Florida, and I can tell you right now, we got a lot of sticky dust. It just loves to mix with the humidity in the air. And it just loves to just lay there. And you can wipe and wipe and wipe until your blows and take your, your brush, 
but it's just stubborn as all get out. But different parts of the country, you'll find different types of things. Interestingly enough, the reason we know so much about dust actually kind of comes from our, our, our photo scanning business. We actually learned that dust that is affixed onto a, um, uh, the scanning elements, when they go up in the air and get pressurized, they could be unaffixed dust, but when they come back down, they're sticky dust. And that we found out from our rentals as we were shipping them around the country. And so now we have to measure the humidity and we take some precautionary uh, steps to eliminate the dust issue there. And that's what we're going to have to do when we deal with the, the um, issue of making a good image and fighting that dust. So I've divided into two areas. So Chris, I'm going to kind of, we'll banter back and forth here for a minute, OK? OK. First of all, environmental. Um, I don't know how you work. We work from the outside in, um, meaning we look at our whole workflow area. And I, I don't, it's not just is the table clean. It's like, is everything in 15 feet of that thing clean? I don't know. How do you deal with dust in that area? Um, I'm pretty much the same way, uh, especially you know, if I'm getting ready to start a job, uh, you know, I'll dust everything down, vacuum the floors, you know, clean up, uh, so there isn't anything blowing in the air as I work. So I do take uh, that in consideration and clean up the environment. The other thing that we do, and I, I, we, we actually, Chris was here, saw our shop. We, we actually moved our, we needed more room, so we moved into a bigger room. And it seems like the bigger room, the more volume of air, and the more volume of air, the more propensity to find dust. So we actually, although we change our air filters around the office every month, we actually change our filters on in that environment, the, the air conditioners feeding that room twice a month, um, and. We, when we moved, we relocated, I put, and don't forget the ducks. I'm telling you, when we went to change it, I looked inside, I actually got the vacuum cleaner out, and we vacuumed out inside the ducks as well, because that thing was, even though we had the filter, it was still full of dust. So that may be a little anal retentive, but it certainly seemed to help us. Um, you want to pay attention to monitor screens and other kind of dust collection items that are laying around. Try not to have too much around um, ceiling fans. I don't know if you've got an overhead fan, but boy, that can create a challenge as well. Um, Chris, have you ever used an ionizing air cleaner? I have not. So we actually did buy an ionizing air cleaner. These are kind of cool tools. We bought ours at Target. I think we've paid about 60 bucks for it. And um, you plug it in. And we keep it near the area where we're scanning. And literally, the air kind of flows through it. It almost looks like a little ventilator type of thing. And, okay. and, but it, it literally sucks the dust onto these two metallic plates that create the charge. And as they do, the dust slicks on there. And you literally pull these blades out and wipe off. Just You won't believe what you wipe off in spite of the fact that you're working so hard to keep the dust away. So if you've got a real big dust problem, which we're in a big room, so we do, you might want to think about that. Not necessarily if you're in a smaller environment, but you might want to think about if you do kind of, you're fighting everything environmentally and you still can't get a handle on it. Now, what do you do about keeping your slides covered? How do you handle that, Chris? Um, a lot of times if I, when I um, obtain a job from a client, a lot of times they're actually already in the care cells. Uh, so we try to keep those uh, still in the original boxes that they came in. Um, if they don't have any boxes or they're loose uh, slides, um, I try to keep them in. Um, I have uh, intake uh, containers that are covered that I try to put those in uh, just to keep until I'm ready to scan them, uh, just so that they don't accumulate any more dust than that may be already on there. Um, but then at that point, then I do the, the cleaning uh, to make sure the dust is uh, off the slides. Okay, perfect. So, so you kind of do the same thing we do. We've got some plastic containers with tops on them. Um, we actually have little, we went out and bought um, little can canisters if they're loose slides, and we put them in, pack them tight. They hold probably about 25 slides so that it does, doesn't let any more dust get in, right? And we'll close the containers up, and then we yeah. kind of have the whole job that way as well. Then we'll put all of those inside a plastic tub. 
Um, another thing from an environmental standpoint has to do with the holders of the mounts themselves. There's a lot of things you got to be a little careful about. One is glass. Um, I don't know, have you scanned a lot of glass slides, Chris? Actually, I have not, to be honest with you, um, okay. but I know they're out there. They're out there. I've we have we have scanned. Uh, I I will say we have scanned enough to to know enough about them to be dangerous. Um, I can tell you that um, the glass ones um, you have to handle differently. The other thing about it is um, we were when we first started scanning our slides that had the glass. I didn't realize it, but there was air, a bubble of air, in behind the glass that then created what I found out to be called Newton's rings. Um, and it literally looked like Saturn with the rings in them. Um, uh, we, have found, we have found mold in them as well. And fingerprints, oh my goodness, you got to really watch out for the fingerprints there. Um, so that's one thing when you're looking at the, if you're looking at the types of slides that you have, you know, from an environmental standpoint, those mounts have to be considered as traps for all the enemy dust and particulate mm -hmm. matter. The other thing is chipboard. Now, um, chipboard are those rough edges, right? So, um, I don't know about you, but Chris, I run into this all the time that people want us to, you know, scan them side by side. In fact, we used to have a, um, a Nikon a 5000 scanner and it had a batch loader on it. And that batch loader would actually stack all these slides up side by side. The plastic ones seemed to do really well, but when we got the chip, they'd kind of hang up on one another. Yeah. And then as they did, they were de generating, even, no much how hard we tried, we kept getting dust because the one would slide against the other one. And right. so that's one of the things, too. I don't know if you've ever run into that, but those rough edges, they can be miserable. Yeah, it create, like you said, it creates dust in itself um, as you're processing them. Yeah, it's almost like 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 sandpapering one to the other in these micro microfibers. And yeah. finally, the plastic. Um, depending how the slides have been kept, I if you're involved in any kind of digitization process, um, you will see slides in all sorts of configurations. I call the slides in the plastic with the garbage in the garbage bag all loose as just they're detrimental to us. And the reason why is because those edges, if you look all around, there's all sorts of little plastic edges with things kind of, you know, gaps and stuff. And those hold dust. So you want to be careful that they get embedded around the edges. So that's something that uh, I'd encourage you to keep a look at. Is there anything else from an environmental standpoint that we've missed, Chris? No, I think that uh, sums it up there. Okay, well let's take a look then. We went ahead and looked next at how to make a great image from a preventative measure. And I'm going to tell you number one is cover your meat hooks and wear photo gloves, photo handling gloves. Uh, is that a practice you, you do, Chris? Or? I do. I do use that not only to, to prevent uh, anything, you know, oil from your fingers or other additional dirt to get on the slides, but also to protect the hands from the stuff that is already on there because we don't know what kind of chemicals or other uh, things that are on there that could uh, hurt our, you know, our hands as well. And, and you make a very good point because the process of developing is ongoing forever. Um, uh, a lot of these materials maybe weren't necessarily washed and bathed in um, enough clean water, and so it didn't necessarily stop the process of development as it had gone through the developer and the hypo or the fixer. And so you can still, and in fact, if you ever walk into a room of old slides and negatives and you smell that smell that's like kind of an ammonia type smell, that's fixer. Those things are still developing this many years later. So that's a good point. Um, the next is my number one shout out for how to beat dust. And that is a volumetric electric blower. Notice I didn't say compressed air. Compressed air uses a propellant. And that propellant, if you tip the can, you've all probably played with that at one point or another. You start getting that white 
foamy stuff, you know, that's the propellant and the, and the condensation of the, the interaction of the air inside and pushing out rapidly through that small nozzle. What we want to use is an electric air blower. And I'm talking about something like the Metro DataVac. It's a 500 watt device. You plug it in and it has pointed uh, tips to it. And that's the one we use most frequently. There is a second one called the, can the Canless Air System O2. Short's name is Hurricane. And it's battery operated. We found that that one works well. It doesn't quite generate as much volume of air out of it. And it also, you don't get all the tips. You have to buy them as separate. So you wind up actually spending, a, you can usually get the Metro back for somewhere between 60 and $80. And you wind up with the Hurricane probably investing about $120 for that. Um, of course, there's the good old, and I bet you've got a couple of them laying around. Do you have any of the uh, Giotto rocket blasters laying around, Chris? I do, actually, yes. You want to explain I, I what, what they the are? Uh, it's basically um, a, a bulb uh, with a, a pointed end that you just squeeze and it creates air that shoots out at the end of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, device, the pump. Um, it kind of looks like the, the, as gross as it is, the, the nose or ear thing as you would use as, for an infant. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, that's really what it looks like. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's just a bulb with a tip on the end of it. It pulls and draws enough air. And again, it's, it's, it's room air. It's not the air. So if your room air is clean and there's no dust and you can blow it quickly and effectively with one of these electric blowers or the battery-operated one or the hand blast, kind of removal tools, you're in good shape. But still, we got to deal with that sticky dust. All right? So the unaffixed dust, we've got a good handle on. But the sticky dust, and that's where a soft camel hair uh, lens brush to dislodge, to dislodge it works. So um, uh, there's all sorts of different kinds. We actually went down to Joann's and bought some I don't know, we probably paid about 20 bucks for the brushes. Um, you want to make sure that they're not going to flick off and then you've got camel hair all over to fight with. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that you protect them. Don't leave them laying around, okay? We put a little cap on ours. Wet mounting is another way. Wet mounting is kind of like the reverse. And what you do is you actually take a solution and you place it in around onto a um, onto the holder and then you mount the slide inside of it right and what will happen is that will level out any kinds of particulate matter and help to pull it out um, I know the Epson uh, V850 is a wet mount you can use a wet mount scanner for that you're going to probably be pretty sophisticated when you deal with that because it's not for the faint of heart the process and it certainly isn't going to be a fast process then finally there's things like uh, film cleaning solutions probably the one that Kodak has one um, if you can find it um, the one I I think it's probably most is the, the PEC film cleaner and the PEC pads. Have you used any of those, Chris? I have. I actually use the, uh, the PEC-12 film cleaner. Okay. Um, and the way I look at that is I use that as a last resort um, because you don't want to take any of the emulsion off um, or anything like that. Depending on the side, that say, for example, if it's mold or some type of heavy dust or heavy dirt, um, I try to use that as a last resort and then maybe only use it once. You know, rather than multiple times trying to clean it off because you you would eventually wear down the um, the uh, the film. Yeah, and 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 it freaked me out the first time I ever used that stuff. But you got to remember that the film was designed to be processed in wet solution, so it's going to be okay, and it's a neutral solution. Um, but it is kind of messy as well, so um, I, I would just. I'd probably stay away from wet mounting and try all these other ones first. Okay, let's see. So the next is using our holders, right, to make great images. And when we use holders, there may be ones that you want to use when you're using your camera or ones that you use with your flatbed. There's a whole variety of them. 
they're not that complicated, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. What I will tell you is, though, that all film has one thing in common, and that is we want to put the emulsion side of the film, of, of the 35 millimeter slide, towards the imaging device. Not towards the light, but towards the imaging device. So you need to understand a little bit about the anatomy of film. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I will show you these two just to help you understand a little bit better. One, we talk about the emulsion side being the dull side and the shiny side being the film base, and you'll notice in proportion how big, how thick, even though they're very thin, how thick the, the film is, the base is, to carry just a little bit of emulsion. And then you can see all the different layers. There's actually eight different layers of the film emulsion, starting with an anti-abrasion level and then different dye levels to absorb certain kinds of light. Then you get the base. Then there's the anti-halation backing. The anti-halation backing stops the reflection going, so as the light passes through it, stops it from going back up through the other way. So you can see that you don't want to flip them around, right, and shoot the, um, the light through the emulsion side and have the anti elation backing um, stopping you. So that's the one thing you want to deal with. There's also a non-curling coating on it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea. There's a great website. I would encourage you, if you have a problem finding what the emulsion and the shiny side of it 35 millimeter slide is. It's a scanning or slide scanning and they have emulsion.html and they have these great little tools. Hold it up at an angle. The film slightly concurve if you're on the emulsion side. The shiny side convex, obviously, um, might be stamped. But the word is operatively might be stamped. Don't trust the writing on the on the uh, mounts at all. So that's a that's a probably a good little tool and probably what I'll do is I'll just show you an example and hopefully you can take away this. So here's an example of a difference where the emulsion side, if you looked at that and hopefully it'll come through clear enough that the emulsion side of this thing is dull and the reflective side is shiny. So you always want to remember that they've got the emulsion side, we want to be towards the image um, device. So in a flatbed, that means what? The image sensor is underneath, so you want to put that down. If you were doing something like Chris and I do slide snap uh, devices, um, we want to put that so that it exposes it out to the, the camera lens. And if you're using a camera, obviously, that's the side you'd want to use. All right. Anything else on that, Chris? Or no, I think you you covered that pretty well. Okay. I will tell you that it does take a while, so just start looking at them, and you'll you you'll be able to tell pretty quick. Yeah. If and you're going to find a if you don't have a scanning tool, um, there's a lot of them out there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Just define your needs, right? Look at your slides. Are you doing slides only? Are you going to be doing negatives? Do you need to do prints as well? Um, you need to decide what you're going to be doing, how the images are going to be used, how much resolution. And then you think about things like the scanning speed and the setup time and the capacity, what it interfaces with from software, and are there complications with that? Um, is it automated? Then you can decide, do I really need to buy this thing, or can I just call up Easy Photo Scan and rent one and have it available for the job I'm doing? Um, do I need a long-term investment or short-term investment? And how big is the thing, right? I mean, those little Wolverine things, they, they're all the rage because why? They're small. You just sit and hold them in your lap and put the pictures in, and a lot of folks wind up using that kind of device. So that's how we look at the, the uh, scanning devices themselves. What I would say is that there is um, some other things you might want to think about as you're making your decision, and that involves what kind of category. Now, I, I've broken them down into, uh, and the author breaks them down into four areas, and I've, the point-and-shoot I call down and dirty. And that's like those little 
small devices that you're spending, I don't know, you see them at uh, Sam's or Costco or Best Buy for $49.99 on up. And uh, you put them in, and they'll digitize, and the resolution will be slow. And obviously, when you spend a small amount of money, you're not going to necessarily get the highest quality. But if all people want to do is to see them digitally and put them up and look at them kind of once in a while, that's, that's certainly uh, a, a doable thing. Then there's an intermediate level, and that's where you might want to spend up um, hundreds of dollars on a good transparent scanner that's like a flatbed, then there's some more advanced models. We talked about the Epson brand where you can move up through the V series of the 700s, 800s, 850 models. Um, then there's the professional models. Epson has a XL series. They just announced a 12,000 series, things like the uh, slide snap with the uh, uh, retrofitted carousel projector with the ultra bright LED illuminance on it and the uh, high high camera, um, high quality camera and we actually shoot them with uh, mirrorless cameras now. So um, like I said, there's a lot of different considerations. The other thing you want to think about is you want to think about um, if you want to do anything at scanning. Kodak uh, owns Digital Ice, LaserSoft has this ISRD, Fuji Films has an image intelligence. Um, there's things like post-processing those. So there's things like Photoshop, uh, uh, Laser Soft Silverfast, um, GIMP has some post-processing, and there's, there's, there's many, many others. But um, take a look at that as you're looking at your scanning device, as, as opposed to um, just making a decision because it's 89 bucks, or because it's $589, or because it's $3,089. Make a decision based on some of these parameters, and I think you'll be very pleased as you move forward. So, Chris, we talking a little bit now into your world as we move through is how to make a great image, and um, I've, I've listed some things about exposure controls and overall lightness and darkness, and um, no tonal changes when you talk about uh, controls. Uh, oh, exposure controls, we're really talking about something like the speed and the shutter. But what about focus? Um, do you work with a, a device that you can auto point or manual focus? Um, I actually use the auto, um, whether I use the uh, a flatbed scanner, um, I use the auto focus um, option for that, as well as with the SlideSnap Pro that I use uh, with the digital uh, SLR camera. Um, I also use the auto um, options on there. Okay, perfect. And resolution, um, input resolution, we usually refer to it in the scanning world as dots per inch. You'll see that they use the um, uh, pixels per inch as the, in the uh, FADGI guidelines as they talk about more of the output part. Um, but remember this, this is an optical and there's an interpolated. Um, I never use interpolated. I don't know about you, Chris. No, I use um, optical all the time. Okay, okay, perfect. So interpolated is kind of just making up information based on the information that's around it. So we want to be careful with uh, uh, kind of making up things, especially since the resolution of today, I mean like this, the, the stuff we're shooting is what, almost 5,000 DPI, so the yeah. equivalent of. So I mean it's kind of hard to, you know, why should I have to interpolate on up, okay? Um, Another thing is color matching, and, and this is an interesting part, and, and Chris, do you want to take a minute and talk a little bit about color matching and, the, and setting up profiles and that type of thing? I know you have a lot of experience with it. Yeah, I just want to mention on the, the first point with the monitor, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the old CRT monitors, uh, you know, if you ever went into an office where you had multiple monitors, every single one of them would all look different in color. One would be a little bit greener or bluer, you know, than the other. Um, and you can still have that with the, the newer monitors now. And they're, again, as I mentioned earlier, built-in ways to properly profile the monitor, um, utilizing a couple questions. And there's some visual things that, you know, that the, the monitor would walk you through to get that to a, a correct you know, to correctly get the color calibrated. You can also buy devices you know, to do that as well. Um, for same thing with the printer. Printer has uh, a particular profile associated with the, the color pattern and the calibration with that as well. 
uh, as well as your scanner. I know, for example, if you're doing, uh, there's different types of film, Fuji, Kodak, uh, Kodachrome uh, slides, and each one of those, depending on your scanner and the software you use, uh, you can pr uh, profile those as well. So then as you're scanning a particular Kodak film, then the output's going to uh, be very similar to the profile of the original film. Um, so all three of those together are very important because if you're scanning something that you're going to be printing, uh, it's also important if you're printing it, to, you know, at a, a press shop or you know, to get their profiles so that everything uh, is matching down to the last, you know, your publication. Or if it is just a print that you're, you know, printing the slides um, from. Uh, so color matching it also is very subjective. You know, it's all like as Rick said earlier, it's all in the you know the eye of the beholder too. Uh, so what may be too green for me may be perfect for someone else. Um, so if you do some of those uh, calibration um, processes, then you at least get a a middle point, and then you can adjust left to right uh, based off of what you see uh, after you scan an image. I hope that helped. <laughs> oh yeah, it did. And 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 and, and I think I can su summarize very quickly. Color matching and color space is a difficult thing to get your arms around. I will tell you this, I believe that if you will first of all in your scanning experience look for keeping a clean environment, shooting at the right appropriate format and getting a good high resolution image, you will then be able to post process as you learn the rest of it. And you can always kind of come back and enhance those things that you've scanned. But if you start in with garbage, with dust, and all sorts of things that you could have gotten rid of, you just have to work way too hard to get them looking good. So right. talking about looking good, we're going to take just a couple of moments now and look through the techniques to enhance images. And we're going to look at a high level, because if you've been involved with any kind of scanning, these words and this that terminology and these concepts are not going to be difficult for you. First of all, we're going to talk about tonal controls, where that's adjusting the brightness, the darkness, the blacks, the and you can even do it on the individual color channels. But there's some things that you need to look at that you have available in different softwares. And you may wind up, I don't know how you do it, Chris, we wind up processing it through at least maybe one or two different applications depending on the job and what the customer wants at the back end. Is right. that do you do that, that or? And th that's true, yeah. Um, and you know, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of times, whether it's a flatbed scanner or even with the, the way I capture the images through, the, uh, through my camera, I try to shoot the, you know, capture the raw um, scan. So then when you get into these post-processing, you have much more uh, leeway and adjustments. Um, so, you know, and it depends on the job too. I mean, what the, the client wants or what you want as you know, if you're scanning your own collection, it also depends on how much you charge. I mean, let's get bright. Let's get you know, kind of down and dirty on this thing. You know, if you're going to clean up every slide and take and blow each one individually out, there's a lot of time and effort. And oftentimes, the clients that's not what they're wanting, right? I mean, I can promise you, these people that hadn't seen their slides for for 60 years, they just wanted to be able to have them and own them digitally. That was their goal. They can always, they're not going to throw their slides away. They can always go back and get the ones that they want if they want to enhance them. But, you know, one of the things, but meanwhile, I had a lady that literally had her father was a professional photographer and I'm not I am not joking, those photographs were absolutely stunning as they were being scanned. We were looking at them and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's, that's another one. And he is some famous nature photographer and I said, wow, you've got a piece of artwork here. And so in that case, maybe the expectations are a little different and, and indeed they were for her. There's right. also color controls. We spent a lot of time about color balancing, and it is a lot to do with the eye of the beholder. I'll never forget the first time we went and worked with a client, and we made all the adjustments, and we matched everything, and she looked at them and said, these pictures are horrible. 
we said, well, they're perfectly matched and with color space and match. And she said, I want them to look like, and we looked at each other when she showed us how she wanted to look at them. And she moved the, the, the slider scale. And we're like, man, those look not the way I would want them to be. But the customer's always right. And she got them the way that she wanted them. So <laughs> I don't know if you ever had that experience. There's some other there's some other controls as well, like sharpness. You can actually use a densitometer on your on your images. Um, there's manual white, gray, black point selections, multiple samplings. Um, that's an interesting feature where you can have a, a setting, an optical setting that kind of defines scanning a whole page with with lots of lots of slides on it, or maybe right down the center where you're going to get more detailed information and you would have that, that optical setting. It'd be the same optical setting, but a little different uh, focus and everything. Um, and then finally, uh, well, that's the top of the, um, the optical scanning, multiple sampling is when we actually scan the image multiple times in order to meet that dynamic range across the, um, the, 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 the digital uh, representation for those slides because they have such a wide dynamic range. All right, so we're winding up here. We'll just finish this with a couple other things. Things to watch out for. Chris, you want to take the first one, resolution? Resolution, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, a lot of times uh, you particular you know, film grain, uh, the uh, dye clusters that um, are in it, uh, there's the curd film as well. Um, and then the intended destination and what you are intending to uh, do with your film or your slides at the end. Um, so uh, part of that choosing the resolution that you want to scan at, um, again looking, you know, I per personally uh, start at least 2500 DPI or up to 4000 is usually uh, what my customers uh, scan their, you know, want their sc slides or film scanned at. Personally, I think with the uh, slide set, um, the camera I use actually yields about 4,000 DPI. So any of the slides that I now do on that uh, machine uh, yields about 4,000 DPI um, across the board. I will tell you this, high, high resolution can bring its own challenges, though. Um, at 4,000 DPI, you'll definitely see more dust. Yes. Um, and more, more imper imperfections. So um, that's why that prep and environment is so important. Um, image tone, brightness, and contrast um, properly set uh, work great uh, if there's two. The image tones is the number of light and dark tones. That's important. And the, the, the brightness and contrast is how they're distributed across. And that's kind of heading into more of our, our uh, histogram type of representation that we spoke about um, a moment ago. Um, then there's the color proportions and their saturation, their brightness, and, and their contrast as well. All of these are things that you'll want to be uh, to watch out for. Now, why you, you know why do we not just cover each and every one of them to the nth degree? The reason why is because they are all in themselves a study that needs to be looked at independently so you understand how things work together. Okay, and um, if you understand the independent components and they come together in a confluence, then boom, you're ready to go. So when good things go bad, this is some of the objects that we have um, noticed around our place. Chris, I'm sure this list can go on and on. In fact, I should probably send a list out and everybody just keep adding to it. But I will tell you. You can fix all of these things, but that's a topic for the next or another session. Freaky, freaky illumination can cause craziness. Freaky photo finishing, mistreatment of film, faded colors, dust and artifact, bad compositions, damaged photos, um, unwanted objects. No joke, we had <laughs> some slides and the lady who had them, they were of a wedding ceremony. She wanted her ex removed from them. I guess that qualifies as a unwanted object. Um, she loved the picture, just didn't care for the rest of the contents in it. Um, <laughs> missing objects and then just blah appearance. So we've had, had uh, those are our lists. I don't know, Chris, can you come up with anything else on your list? I mean, what I've experienced, uh, that list uh, encompasses that. I mean, a lot of times, uh, 
you know, you can't, I mean, you can, if it's a bad photo in itself, sometimes you can't change that. But, you know, as far as color or brightness and things like that, you can definitely uh, adjust that. Uh, you can obviously, like, you know, you mentioned remove objects or, or you know, a lot of times with slide film, too, uh, or any film, uh, you maybe get a double exposure. Uh, so sometimes you get two photos in one and some, you know, there's a dominant photo or image there. It, it, and those can be fixed, again, they all take time in post-processing to, to handle those. Well, Chris, we're kind of kind of coming up to our time. I, I did want to, if anybody's got any questions, um, I'd love to uh, see if they pop up here at this point in time. Um, I think you can just run down into the chat area and send out a question to us. Um, I'm going to... Um, at this point, I think I'll just flip up here to our email addresses, and you can reach me at info at easyphotoscan.com and Chris at chris at cdsmediasolutions.com. And we're looking forward to the opportunity to answer any specific questions you might have. I'd encourage you to, um, if you've got a question and it didn't get answered here, please feel free to uh, pose the question to us and we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as possible as well as um, if you want to when you get your uh, uh, survey at the end uh, you can add it there as well and we'll, we'll do our best. Don't forget to fill out the survey. You do get a chance at um, this book, um, a brand new one um, that we used as our guide and it's something that I find on my library and um, We'll uh, make sure that Chris gets a copy. I don't think he has a copy. We're going to make sure Chris gets a copy as a way of expressing our appreciation and thanks for him showing up today to help us. So I don't see any questions at this point, I don't think. Let me look and see here. Um, there is a handout. I will do that. And at that point, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you, Rick. And I look forward to everybody um, jumping on board next month when we talk about scanography. How much fun. And I've got a book on my shelf that I, I keep that's uh, uh, a guy from the New York Library that made a whole book on scanning his lunch every day for a year. And we'll share a little bit about that as well as some of the, <laughs> as well as some of the other things you can do. You can get pretty creative and imaginative. So thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to having the opportunity to have you join us at another time. If you've got a question, please feel free to let us know.